If you're tired of these promos, supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv for the links to sign up. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of May 2, 2021. The podcast that invented the Braille steering wheel. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's naphthalize the news of the bogus. So we're getting a pretty good picture of what Biden's America is going to look like. Spoiler alert, mostly the same, but worse. Now the Biden administration is considering a ban on menthol cigarettes because they're the kind preferred by black people. Because you totally fight racism by taking away the things black people choose or something. A coalition of groups, including the NAACP and the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, have shown that they long ago stopped being advocates for racial equality when they released a joint letter saying, quote, The predatory marketing of menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products must be stopped, and we should all recognize this as a social justice issue, and one that disproportionately impacts youth and communities of color. Because black people are stupid and can't make their own decisions, and so government needs to ban things they like that are unhealthy. Menthol is currently the only flavor allowed in cigarettes. The others were prohibited by law in 2009, because that helped somehow. No, it actually didn't. The number of smokers per capita continued to drop at the same rate it had been since the 1970s. But I'm sure black people will totes stop smoking once this ban is in place. Many groups that actually represent African Americans, including Al Sharpton's National Action Network, have spoken out against a ban, but no one cares what they think. They were joined by the ACLU and the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, as well as several others, in a letter where they said, quote, With a criminal legal system that incarcerates blacks at nearly six times the rate of white Americans, and a prison population that is 67% black and Latinx, Any prohibition on menthol and flavored tobacco products promises continued over-criminalization and mass incarceration of people of color. A ban on menthol and flavored tobacco products could reintroduce many of the harms imposed by the failed war on drugs as lawmakers work to legalize cannabis and take a public health approach to opioids. A bill criminalizing tobacco is contrary to those efforts. But they're just being silly. I mean, it's not like we'll see any Eric Garner-style police brutality on this issue. He was killed for selling loose cigarettes without collecting the tax. But black market menthol cigarettes? Couldn't happen. It's just too difficult to spray menthol on some tobacco and roll it up. Or inject it into the filter or whatever. So much more difficult than a meth lab. Advocates deny this by saying that the law will just be enforced against sellers, not smokers. But it's not like Big Tobacco will be defying the law on this. It'll be the Eric Garners selling them to their fellow African Americans, giving police even more of an excuse to crack down in these neighborhoods. This isn't speculation. Massachusetts banned menthol cigarettes in 2020, and they're already prosecuting black market sellers. And we've covered several times how they just don't like effective tobacco harm reduction methods such as e-cigarettes. It's almost as if they want them to keep smoking and die. And now, face even greater law enforcement action as well. The press is no help. They keep extolling the benefits of a ban while giving hardly any time to the skeptics. As journalist Mark Gunther noticed, quote, Some people choose to smoke, knowing the risks. The voices of smokers are noticeably absent from this debate. By contrast, anti-tobacco groups like Action on Smoking and Health depict smokers as helpless, unable to resist the predatory marketing of big tobacco. They're laughably trying to pitch the ban as a social justice issue. They apparently want you to forget that marijuana was banned because of its appeal to blacks. But the fact is, if the ban is put in place, White smokers would be free to purchase the unflavored cigarettes favored by most of them, while black smokers would be forbidden from pursuing their own desires absent a trip to the local drug dealer. The FDA has until April 29 to respond to the petition. If they approve it, it'll go to Biden for his signature. If you're looking for ways to support this channel, but you don't have any spare cash and you can't stand advertisements, you can do so by generating your own cryptocurrency. 
Use the links at the bottom of the description to listen to the podcast and all of my videos on BitTube.tv or LBRY.tv to get cryptocurrency for the creator and yourself. Or if you listen to the podcast at the podcast page, you'll also generate crypto. You can also go to airtime.bogosity.tv to get the airtime extension and generate crypto for yourself and the creators on the web anywhere you go, including my YouTube channel. Get five tubes free just for installing the extension and signing up, and then simply browse the web as normal. Easily monetize your favorite creators and yourself with cryptocurrency without advertising on BitTube.tv or LBRY.tv or with the Airtime extension at Airtime.Pagosity.tv. During the Cold War, there was a special phone line set up between the White House and the Kremlin so that the American president and the Soviet premier could talk whenever they wanted to. The lines of communication were open, and mutual respect between the two superpowers likely avoided all-out nuclear war. We'd like to think that those days are over, but actually, according to Russia's top diplomat, things are worse. A lack of mutual respect, coupled with a lack of communication, according to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, is causing unprecedented tension. He says Moscow is ready to normalize ties between the two countries, but the White House is posturing like a sovereign while rallying its allies against Russia and China. Quote, During the Cold War, the tensions were flying high, and risky crisis situations often emerged, but there was also a mutual respect. It seems to me there is a deficit of it now. These comments come after the Biden administration imposed sanctions against Russia for interfering in the 2020 election and for hacking federal agencies with solar wind, neither of which are supported by evidence. In an interview with Tucker Carlson, Glenn Greenwald confirmed the issue, quote, The relationship between the U.S. and Russia is clearly at its low point since any time, at least since the Cold War. There's little doubt about that. You ask any analyst and they'll tell you that. And the reason I think is twofold. One is that during Russiagate and this whole hysteria that surrounded it, there was this propaganda campaign to convince a huge part of the population, namely liberals and Democrats, that Russia posed this existential threat to the United States. The other part of it is, the war on terror is winding down. We're not in Iraq anymore. We're coming out of Afghanistan. And so the question is, how do you keep weapons manufacturers who exert huge amounts of influence and power in Washington with the business where the government keeps using taxpayer money to buy weapons that don't do any good for anyone? Greenwald also pointed out that the Ukraine issue has a lot to do with it. Quote, there was a huge bipartisanship pressure campaign on President Obama to send lethal arms to Ukraine, and all you have to do is look at a map or history of how Russia was almost twice destroyed in the 20th century to see the crucial importance of Ukraine to Russia. But Obama's point was correct, which was, it has no crucial importance to us, so why would we want to risk confrontation with a nuclear-armed power over Ukraine? And I think the reason why people don't question it is because they're afraid that if you stand up and say it's not worth U.S. lives, U.S. treasure, or any kind of U.S. interest to protect Ukraine from Moscow, you get accused of being an apologist for the Kremlin or someone serving Russian interests, and that's become a very powerful political weapon that shapes our discourse and is affecting all aspects of our policy. The Biden administration expelled 10 Russian diplomats and targeted dozens of companies and people, as well as curbing Russia's ability to borrow money, while at the same time calling for de-escalating tensions. It's almost enough to make you want Donald Trump back. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government censors. It's essential in this day and age. So go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world. And they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home. And don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. 
You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. Another country that seems to be off-limits for criticism is Israel. Anyone who would dare to say that they're anything other than a force for good for all humanity is branded as an anti-Semite and literally Hitler. Except that now, Human Rights Watch has come out and listed Israel as an apartheid state. In their 213-page report, A Threshold Crossed, Israeli Authorities and the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution, they said, quote, Throughout most of the occupied Palestinian territory, which includes the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, Israel is the sole governing power. In the remainder, it exercises primary authority alongside limited Palestinian self-rule. Across these areas and in most aspects of life, Israeli authorities methodically privilege Jewish Israelis and discriminate against Palestinians. Laws, policies, and statements by leading Israeli officials make plain that the objective of maintaining Jewish-Israeli control over demographics, political power, and land has long guided government policy. In pursuit of this goal, authorities have dispossessed, confined, forcibly separated, and subjugated Palestinians by virtue of their identity to varying degrees of intensity. In certain areas, as described in this report, these deprivations are so severe that they amount to the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. And Kenneth Roth, executive director of Human Rights Watch, said, quote, Prominent voices have warned for years that apartheid lurks just around the corner if the trajectory of Israel's rule over Palestinians does not change. This detailed study shows that Israeli authorities have already turned that corner and today are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. The International Criminal Court defines apartheid as a crime against humanity consisting of three elements. One an intent to maintain domination by one racial group over another, a context of systematic oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group, and three, inhumane acts. Now, before anyone decides to go to crying human rights watch as some sort of Nazi organization or anything, journalist Craig Murray pointed out in his blog, quote, This cannot be dismissed as the usual suspects. The report is a formal, legal analysis of what constitutes the crime of apartheid and whether Israeli actions and statutes meet that bar, and it concludes that Israel is an apartheid state, not as a matter of political categorization, but in a formal, legal sense. Roth is respected as a lawyer, and Human Rights Watch is an organization to which people, not just in the State Department, but at senior levels of the Biden administration, genuinely listen, if not always taking heed. Roth said, quote, Denying millions of Palestinians their fundamental rights, without any legitimate security justification, and solely because they are Palestinian and not Jewish, is not simply a matter of an abusive occupation. These policies, which grant Jewish Israelis the same rights and privileges wherever they live and discriminate against Palestinians to varying degrees wherever they live, reflect a policy to privilege one people at the expense of another. In a press release accompanying the report, Human Rights Watch said, quote, Israeli authorities should dismantle all forms of repression and discrimination that privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinians, including with regards to freedom of movement, allocation of land and resources, access to water, electricity, and other services, and the granting of building permits. The ICC Office of the Prosecutor should investigate and prosecute those credibly implicated in the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Countries should do so as well in accordance with their national laws under the principle of universal jurisdiction and impose individual sanctions, including travel bans and asset freezes, on officials responsible for committing these crimes. In the report, they cover numerous inhumane acts by the State of Israel, including violations of liberty of movement, land confiscation, forcible property transfer and the demolishing of Palestinian homes, denial of residency rights, and suspension of civil rights. It even includes things like a denial of electric and water utilities and trials in an Israeli military court with a near 100% conviction rate based on secret evidence. If you're lucky enough not to simply be held without trial, 
Marie's summary is a good read if you don't want to go through the whole report, and it includes some very powerful graphics that accompany the analysis. Do you have children, or nieces or nephews? Are you homeschooling, or just want to counter some of the socialist indoctrination most children get in school? If so, go to bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins and you'll be taken to a website where you can get some great books for elementary age children. The Tuttle Twins books are books about liberty and free market economics that include children's versions of Bastiat's The Law, Leonard Reed's I Pencil, and Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, as well as books about the Federal Reserve and how regulations protect business cronies. They'll learn about the harm caused by eminent domain, or regulations passed in the name of safety, and fundamental concepts of liberty. And as you can see from the sample pages on the website, they're all easy to read and nicely illustrated. They're just $9.99 a piece, or get a special discount as well as free bonuses when you purchase all five. You can even buy in bulk to donate to schools and local libraries. So get the Tuttle Twins books at bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins. <laughs> And now it's time to recanonize this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week it goes to UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, one of the big but far from the only voices in opposition of end-to-end -end encryption. Turns out he uses end-to-end -end encryption himself. Rules for thee, not for me. Johnson's personal phone number was leaked by tabloid Popbitch. They wrote, it's not as though the Prime Minister's personal phone number could just be floating out there on the internet, could it? It would be absolutely insane if it was tacked onto the bottom of an old press release that he dished out freely while MP for Henley and Shadow Minister for Higher Education. Of course, that's exactly what happened, and Johnson hadn't bothered to change his phone number out of basic security, even though it had been 15 years. But people investigating his phone number have confirmed that Johnson is a user of both WhatsApp and Signal, two apps that provide secure texting and phone calls with end-to-end -end encryption. This story finally prompted Johnson to change his number, by the way, but who wants to bet his new number, whatever it is, is on Signal too? But it's too late, Johnson. Your moment of embarrassment is here, and it's undeniable and it comes on the heels of reports that other ministers who were trying to ban encryption were also on Signal and or WhatsApp. I don't think this story needs any further comment other than to reiterate that Boris Johnson is this week's Biggest Bogani Emitter. I want to tell you about the eyeglasses I've been wearing for years. As people can see on my videos, I have a very strong prescription, which makes glasses more expensive, especially when I need computer glasses, reading glasses, prescription sunglasses, and most expensively, progressive lenses for general everyday wear. To save money while still getting quality glasses, I get them from Fermu. In fact, I just got a pair of progressives with high-index aspherical lenses and a nice pair of frames my wife loves for just over $100. It would have been $500 to get them through my eye doctor. Not only do they look good, the glasses are durable. I've worn many pairs for several years without problems. All orders come with a 30-day return policy, a 3-month warranty, and one-on-one -on -one customer service. Go to Firmu, that's F-I-R-M-O-O -O dot Bogosity dot TV anytime you need quality glasses at a low price. Once again, that's Firmu dot Bogosity dot TV. And now let's salsify this week's Idiot Extraordinary! And it's Biden's first one since becoming president, for demonstrating once again the disdain he feels for the Constitution and the First Amendment in particular. In his first full address to Congress, as meager and socially distanced as it was, he promised to reform the horrendous crime bills passed in the last 50 years that he sponsored. But that isn't even what I want to talk about. If there's anything that Joe Biden hates more than justice, it's the Constitution. And after decades of rallying against and even acting against free speech that he doesn't like, he made a completely boneheaded statement showing just how he feels about his oath of office. 
At 1.26.15 in the C-SPAN video for the speech, regarding his plan to destroy the Second Amendment based on the long-debunked lie that it'll stop gun violence, he said, That there are too many people today who are able to buy a gun, but shouldn't be able to buy a gun. And no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And this wasn't the first time. Over a year ago, in cell phone video of him berating a Detroit auto worker, Biden said, about how you intend on getting the union vote when there is a large portion of the union workers that are gun enthusiasts and you are actively trying to diminish our Second Amendment right and take away our guns. You're full of shit. All right, I thank did, you. Now, no, no, shush. Shush. I support the Second Amendment. Second Amendment, just like right now, if you yell fire, that's not free speech. In showing his hatred for the Second Amendment, he's showing his hatred for the First. As we showed on this podcast 10 years ago on September 12, 2011, the phrase comes from a horrendous Supreme Court decision, Schenck v. United States. This case happened after Charles Schenck was prosecuted for printing leaflets in protest of the draft. In blatant violation of his free speech rights, he was arrested and convicted, and the court upheld his conviction. And it was Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. who made the famous statement, quote, The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. So, yes, if you've ever used that phrase to justify some kind of government infringement of our rights, you've used the phrase of someone making an excuse to stop someone from protesting the military draft. Congratulations. Feel good about yourself. This decision was nullified in Brandenburg v. Ohio. Here, the Supreme Court narrowed the scope of not only Schenck, but also other decisions as well, stating that two requirements must be in place in order for speech to be considered a clear and present danger. 1. The speech must not only attempt to incite others to lawless action, but have a real possibility of doing so. And 2. The lawless action being incited must constitute an imminent threat. This is now known as the Eminent Lawless Action Test, which was clarified in Hess v. Indiana to say that speech inciting future lawless action is, in fact, protected. So anyone who would say you can't falsely shout fire in a crowded theater would advocate a system that would jail people for protesting war, quintessential protected speech. The statement itself was never even precedent. It was just dicta, as Schenck wasn't about fires or theaters. And Holmes himself changed his mind a few years later, saying in his dissent in Abrams v. United States, quote, I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so eminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Only the emergency that makes it immediately dangerous to leave the correction of evil counsels to time warrants making any exception to the sweeping command, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The whole point of the Bill of Rights is that it's without exception. That's why the Second Amendment does not say guns shall not be banned. It says the right shall not be infringed. Even the tiniest restriction is an infringement. If you say that someone should be required to stand on one leg for three seconds before buying a gun, that's an infringement. And if we're going to use Brandenburg as a basis for a Second Amendment exception just like the first, then action can only be taken against a gun owner who represents a credible and imminent threat, which police can already do. Which is why people like Joe By don't quote Brandenburg. He didn't say imminent lawless action, did he? He quoted Schenck even though there's no truth whatsoever to the idea that you can't falsely shout fire in a crowded theater, and there never was. Ken White's 2015 article on Popat is a good guide to language like this. It's number two in his nine tropes of people who advocate censorship. Just so you know, the other eight are hate speech, not all speech is protected, the line between free speech and fill in the blank, Balancing free speech and fill in the blank. It isn't free speech, it's fill in the blank. Fighting words. As so and so explained. And the law is always changing. See how many of those you think apply to Joe By, and ask yourself how many of them apply to the Second Amendment as well as the First. Biden just wants to be able to swipe the Constitution under the rug whenever it's inconvenient for his sociopathic policies. 
and to do it, he defended the jailing of someone for protesting war. So that just has to make Joe Biden this week's Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this There's Nobody In Here, We're All Holograms edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please go to donate.bogosity.tv for several ways to support and discord.bogosity.tv to join the discussion. Subscribe at Patreon or Subscribestar and you can listen early and ad-free. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Ron Paul. Humanitarian arguments are always used to justify government mandates related to the economy, monetary policy, foreign policy, and personal liberty. This is on purpose to make it more difficult to challenge. But initiating violence for humanitarian reasons is still violence. Good intentions are no excuse and are just as harmful as when people use force with bad intentions. The results are always negative. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Bogosity. We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now.